Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, my name's Charlotte Ainsley, and um, I work with FOSI as their UK and EU policy consultant. Um, and today we're going to be doing a grand tour of um, worldwide online safety policy. Um, before we start, I'm just going to invite each of our panellists to introduce themselves. So I'll start with you, Letitia. Hi, everyone. My name is Letitia Avia. I'm a digital policy advisor, advising uh, governments, uh, organizations, companies, and digital policy. I was a member of the French Parliament, drafted uh, the law against online hate speech, and worked with the European Commission on the Digital Services Act. Hello, my name is Julia Cook. I'm an international policy manager at Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator, and very recently the online safety regulator. I work in our international team with um, a lot of other colleagues worldwide on online safety to support global alignment with coherent regulation. Hi, good morning everyone. My name's Lisa Robinson. I work uh, with the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD, uh, which is an international organisation. Um, I work in the Science and Technology and Innovation Directorate, specifically in the Digital Economy Policy Division. And then within that, I work in the Digital Safety Team. So great to be here today. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Tallon. I am the Manager of Regulatory Policy and Strategy at the Australian eSafety Commissioner's Office, which I realize is confusing given that my <laughs> accent and Lisa's are switched. <laughs> um, <laughs> but very proudly representing the Australian government here today. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. So we are the uh, Australia's national online safety regulator and educator. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll agree we've got some people from all across the world. So I, I know that um, some people have only just arrived, so um, including me, well, I've been here a day, so um, excuse the jet lag. Um, I'm sure you'll all be aware, but we've all been grappling with online safety policy regulation for a number of years. I've worked in this sphere for over 20 years and we've gone on a huge journey in terms of regulation legislation. And we do have some legislation, regulation now, which is, um, I'm, I'm fresh from, from London, so we have the Online Safety Act, which, which received royal assent just at the end of October. So we're going to hear today from across the world about some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, how the legislation and regulation has been implemented and what we can do to drive that forward and how we can progress that, particularly in the US. We are throwing down the gauntlet to, to the US to, to develop their own um, policy legislation in, in the area. So we've got until around 12-ish for our panellists, and then we're going to invite some questions from you guys in the audience for, for our panellists. So before we start, um, I just wanted to ask each of my panellists what their day job looks like and what sorts of things they do. So I'll start with you, Kelly, this time. So tell us about some of the sorts of things that you do in, in your day job. Sure, thank you. So as I said, I'm the manager of regulatory policy and strategy at the eSafety Commissioner's Office. So uh, basically, we are looking to um, implement sort of strategic implementation of a regulatory framework in order to make sure that the public policy goals underlying it are, are met. And part of that is reactive, and, and part of it's a bit more proactive. So in the reactive space, there are parliamentary inquiries and consultations being held, um, it seems, constantly. Yeah. Um, so we are, we're feeding into those um, uh, through our experience and expertise in implementing the Online Safety Act um, and contributing to those discussions. So recently in Australia we've had inquiries on um, feeding on the, the theme that's emerged this morning on generative AI yeah, and its use yeah. in educational environments um, and our Department of Industry, Science and Resources also looking at the sort of broader uh, use of AI across Australia. Um, and then in the more sort of proactive space, we are really wanting to make sure that we are future focused and agile and kind of ready for the emerging challenges that are coming up, um, including things like generative AI, but also looking at um, the, the effects of recommender systems and decentralization and other emerging issues on online safety and how they can create sort of benefits and challenges. So we also have um, a work stream that we call sort of tech trends and challenges, and we uh, do some horizon scanning and we speak to experts who are working in the area to try to develop up um, positions that help um, ready us to deal with those challenges. Great, great. Thank you, Kelly. Lisa. Sure, thanks. So um, 
For those of you who might not know, the OECD, uh, we are an organization that has uh, 38 member countries. We also have some partnerships with, uh, we have input from other uh, other stakeholders such as business and civil society and the internet community. So um, what the OECD does is we do work related to evidence gathering. Uh, we do work related to bringing different countries together to be able to, um, <coughs> pardon me, to, to be able to, to find consensus in relation to, to thorny issues such as the ones that we're, we're talking about today. Um, so my day job looks a little bit different probably to everybody else's on the panel. So we take more of a sort of a bird's eye view in relation to what's going on. We work with our member countries to understand um, in particular what, what different problems are. Um, and then as a secretariat, um, we work at um, developing evidence bases um, and also uh, helping countries um, from that evidence base uh, to, to consider what sort of policy might be needed. Um, and then we don't do that on a country by country basis. Um, part of sort of some of the OECD's reason for being really is that we can bring together the different countries and, and sort of give some guidance as to where policy might flow in the same direction from the same country, from the, uh, the same, uh, from the same direction. Um, and that, that then can help avoid problems such as regulatory fragmentation, which is really important in this space, uh, where we have a lot of actors working across a different lot of borders. Um, and we also have damage and harm happening to people across borders. So we, we look at how we can sort of bring policy together. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. So at the um, international team where I work, a lot of my work is sort of in three different phases. The first would be sharing our approach with others, helping um, share our evidence base. So for example, at Ofcom, we have over 100 different pieces um, of research that we've um, done as defined projects. So a lot of the time we're happy to share that with others. There's no point duplicating it if somebody else has done it. So a large part is sharing our work and our approach with others, um, again, to support that regulatory alignment that Lisa's talked about. Equally, a second part of my job is bringing other people's expertise into our domestic policy teams. So we have over 350 people working on online safety um, domestically at Ofcom. So a lot of what I'm doing is actually bringing a lot of the expertise from other countries, and um, particularly, for example, eSafety's roadmap um, for age verification, yeah. sharing that with our internal teams to help develop um, our policy thinking and make sure we're abreast of other things going on. And then the third thing is probably... Um, setting up the structures to be able to share that in a strategic um, way. So we have the Global Online Safety Regulators Network yeah. and we have other um, forums to make sure that we're sharing that coherently and consistently with as many people as possible. Great, thank you. Leticia, thank you. Um, I have, I will say, a different work when I am abroad and when I'm in Europe. I've been working the last year here in DC for the Center for American Progress, trying to uh, uh, explain uh, what is European regulation and how it can benefit also for the safety of uh, American citizens uh, from American companies, tech companies. And then when I work in Europe where we already have the regulation, I'm mostly working on making sure it is implemented, that we have the good resources, the good uh, evidence, the good people, that the good place, doing the good work. So all the work we've been doing in drafting the regulation also uh, comes into action. Mm -hmm. And what I do also is a lot of uh, advocacy. So this is what I'm doing right now here. <laughs> so what I would do also on uh, public media, uh, writing articles, etc., to empower as much pos uh, people as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, in terms of who's leading the way in, in online safety reg regulation, I don't want to cause any kind of you know, <laughs> bonfire here. Um, who, who do we say is leading our way? I know Australia were, were probably the first to have their, their act, um, but who, who else is kind of leading the way? That we have the DSA, we have the, the Online Safety Act. I will say Europe. Yeah. This is, but we can have a little debate. But I will, I will definitely think that Europe has the most uh, comprehensive uh, masterpiece in terms of digital regulation. That is something that has been built to work for the next decade, and uh, this is something that is very uh, flexible. When we talk about the DSA, I like to say that it is like like a recipe, but without all the ingredients saying that the DSA is a regulation that tells 
the major element that you need to have a safer, a safer internet uh, space. But doesn't tell the tech companies you have to to hire this number of moderators, for example. Mm. So they will do their own recipe, and then it has to be good. Yeah. And if the cake is not good, then the regulator will come and will say, OK, I want to have the detail of your uh, recipe, and I, want, and I will tell you how to change it. So this kind of flexibility mm -hmm. makes it, I think, a bit stronger that uh, over laws or regulation that we could have seen, even the one that I drafted in France that was too specific to be uh, as efficient that uh, we would have loved uh, it to be. So yeah, yeah. that's why I will say, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, do you want to counteract that? Okay. <laughs> I think for us in the UK, what's really fantastic is that we're seeing there isn't just one approach. There are lots of different countries now bringing out this legislation, and for us that's really important because the harms don't stop at one border, mm -hmm. so it's really encouraging that lots of different countries have things. We, as you mentioned, passed our legislation in October after quite a long time going through our parliament, <laughs> so we were delighted to have that come through. And just there last week at Ofcom, we um, launched the first set of documents to start operationalising that. And I think the fact that we're able to work in forums like the Global Online Safety Regulators Network with people that have that legislation like eSafety, we're able to mm. work together, learn from each other and essentially make the same aims. Everybody's looking to try and have a safer life online for our users. Mm. So the fact that we have those different approaches, it's just really encouraging that there isn't just one, yeah. um, it is happening across lots of different international borders. And similarly, I think in the UK, it's maybe, um, we often describe it as a regulatory cousin to the Digital <laughs> Services Act. They're very similar, they have very um, similar aims and ideals to make that safer. And we use a lot of the same regulatory tools. Mm -hmm. We all use uh, things like the risk assessments, transparency notices, as we've seen eSafety use transparency notices as well. Yeah. And it's really great to see that a lot of those regulatory tools are being deployed across different areas. Yeah, what would um, what would you guys say were the drivers for for regulation? Is it privacy? Is it child safety? Is it is it adult adult harms? What what were some of the key drivers for for the regulation to actually happen and come into force? Myself or <laughs> anybody? Yeah. Uh, why don't I take that from a, from an international perspective? And thank you for not putting me in the position of voting a, <laughs> a leader because of my patriotic answer might have been Australia, but my diplomatic answer probably would have been very different. Um, look, I, um, I, I think that um, it, it kind of seems to the outsiders or it seems to observers that there's sort of a rush of legislation and, and maybe this has come out of nowhere, but... There certainly has been, um, well, certainly the Australian uh, regulation or regulatory body has been in place for a long time. Um, but at the international level, there's been a, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, instruments or and other agreements and guidance that has come have come along. Certainly in the children's space, mm -hmm. um, and uh, <coughs> that doesn't mean that there's not also a focus on online safety um, for adults or for other harms as well. Um, but there, there has been for many years a lot of focus in relation to um, sort of how can we uh, at an international level focus on online safety. So if the OECD has a recommendation on children in the digital environment, um, which I'm very happy to speak to anybody about here, if you want to grab me in the break and, and as, as, as necessary we can, we can talk about it. Um, but that recommendation calls for safety by design um, and also puts a priority on, on, on safety as much as on sort of ben prioritising benefits. Um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child also made a comment in relation to children in the digital environment. The Council of Europe has, has some guidelines. The ITU has guidelines. Um, the, the World Economic Forum just recently released some guidelines. So it does feel like there's a rush of legislation, but there certainly has been a, a lot of conversation yeah. um, for a really long time about this. Um, and I, I think the privacy and safety question is, is a really interesting one in that um, because a lot of these harms are happening um, where da the data regulator has been established for such a really long time. Um, what, what we saw at the OECD when we did some research a few years back was that um, da uh, sort of the responsibility for regulating for safety was falling at the data regulator's foot, mm -hmm. um, which is not necessarily where it should be. And so some of the moves that we're now seeing for online safety regulators is kind of, you know, sort of meeting that need and that balance. Yeah. 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 Do you? 
Sorry, Kelly. Go Sorry, on. I was just going to hop in there if I could. I think it's all of the above as, as the drivers. I mm. think the we often talk about safety, privacy, and security as sort of the three yeah. um, legs of the, the stool of overall sort of online trust. Um, I think what's really heartening, and I do think there, there are certain areas where you can get consensus and other areas where there is maybe less so. Mm. I think in children's online safety, their rights, their best interests, that's probably where you can get mm. um, the, the most buy-in from the, the greatest number. So we did start originally in 2015 as the Children's eSafety Commissioner yeah. um, with a remit that was specifically looking to address um, remediate harms around child online cyberbullying, mm. and then also um, illegal and restricted content with a focus on child sexual exploitation material. Um, as we began to implement that initial legislation it became clear that online safety issues are not, you know, restricted to children. They are certainly a really, really important component still. Um, but we, uh, over sort of uh, a period of years, expanded our regulation um, and remit into different sort of areas and now um, offer a, a couple of different schemes, including one for cyber abuse of, of adults who are experiencing um, really severe harm online as well. Um, and I feel like I'm going to lose my thread. Oh, but you mentioned safety by design, which I wanted to come back to. So I think when we first started, um, the, the professions of security and online privacy are, are really well established. Mm -hmm. um, and when we first sort of started out and we, were, we, we found ourselves kind of adding end safety to a bunch of documents and really trying to explain mm -hmm. to people what we meant by the concept of safety by design. People had, um, in some cases, heard of privacy by design, but they didn't really always understand what we were speaking about when we were talking about safety and online harms generally. And I think we've been on a real journey over the past eight years or so where we no longer, when we get a document for input, we're not finding ourselves having to add safety and safety by design because it is um, in increasingly sort of um, already in the lexicon, which is really great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I just yeah. had one word, um, it definitely goes in the same direction. If you look at the European regulation, it doesn't define what is online safety. Because we had 27 countries who had to agree on what is mm -hmm. online safety, and we didn't even try to do that. Because the focus will be different for each country. Some will think more about uh, data privacy. Some will think more about uh, hate speech. That was mostly German people, for example. In France, we're more about terrorism. And we have some of our countries where are more focused on child safety. But at the end of the day, when you look at uh, the uh, measures, what is really in the trust in the law, it's the same thing because we have the same means to address this. And then uh, the focus of a country, the focus of the people is not the same, yeah. but what we have to do to address it is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. It is to be safe by design, to be transparent, yeah. to do risk assessment, uh, and to take action, and to be accountable because no regulation works if you don't have fines behind it. Yeah, yeah. Julia, from the UK perspective, would you say there are different drivers or are they common across the UK as well? I'd say there's a lot of commonality there. For us, it is to make sure that UK users live a safer li life online. And we, are pri we have to prioritise where we start within um, operationalising the Online Safety Act. And we've started with the illegal harms. Yeah. So some of the harms that are most um, you know, distressing for users some of those are focused on children, so particularly around child sexual exploitation and abuse material, but there are also a lot that are um, around adults as well, so particularly around terrorism, so similar to what Letitia has mentioned. We then will have different phases, so in our second phase we're going to be looking at a lot of the um, harms that are particularly difficult for children, um, things that might be legal. Um, but still have that negative output on children. And then we have a third phase as well, which will be around user empowerment yeah. um, to help empower all users, whether they're adults and children. Um, so there's the, the same drivers. We want to see the same outcomes. We want people to be able to um, have a rights respecting regime where they're able to um, you know, use their right to participation um, have their um, freedom of expression online, whilst also having their right to privacy and balancing all of that with online safety. So I'd say a lot of the drivers are the same. Um, we all want the internet to be somewhere people can you know, show up as their full authentic selves and feel safe doing that. Um, but we, we are prioritising where we start in a very similar way. Yeah, yeah. So lots of similarities and, and commonalities, but I would imagine for global industry it's quite challenging to um, go into different markets and to not there, there is a certain amount of fragmentation and meeting the the regulatory and legislative frameworks in in the country lisa i don't know i think you did some work around the fragmentation around this um and what's happening internationally certainly i'm i'm 
I mean, so we we did some some work a few years back, having a look at um, what the landscape looked for like children online in general. So not in relation to harms necessarily, but in relation to what the legislation looked like and how different countries were responding, um, or what their what their laws looked like in relation to protecting or meeting the needs for children online. Um, and this is what led to the recommendation that we eventually um, developed. Um, which is a soft law instrument which gives guidance to, to governments in relation to what policies they should put into place. Um, and that's exactly what I mentioned before when we said we saw that a lot of, sort of privacy data regulators, the responsibility was falling at their feet. Um, at, at that stage, we saw a lot of regulatory fragmentation, um, a lot of siloed responsibilities, so data, data protection uh, agencies might be responsible for something. Criminal justice might be responsible for something. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we recommended um, was exactly a lot of what you're seeing now. So single oversight bodies, such as what you have at eSafety Commissioner or an Ofcom or what mm. will come out under mm. the DSA, um, which was putting together a body that can coordinate responses. Um, I think as we as we are seeing more online safety regulators um, come forward, we want to make sure um, that with these new laws that come forward, we don't end up in the same position where there's more fragmentation in relation to these laws. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where organisations like the OECD come in, where we can bring you know, different, uh, different countries together um, to talk in relation to, to these sorts of things. For example, we talked a little bit about safety by design, some of the yeah. work that we're doing now, um, which isn't finished, so I, I can't really give you any um, outcomes as yet, but We've recognised that a lot of international documents, all the ones I, I mentioned before, call for safety by design. Such as, uh, countries such as Australia have safety by design in their, in their laws. Other laws have safety by design elements, even if they might not call it that way. So what we're looking at is sort of well, what does this mean and how can we bring this together and how can we give guidance, which is useful for all stakeholders, so not just governments, but also um, industry and also children and their parents themselves to sort of understand what's meant by this um, and how it can be implemented. Yeah. So what would we say the, the major challenges are for, for regulation? Um, that's, a, that's a big big question. I know, Letitia, I'll come to you first. What would you say the major challenges are? I think it's not to be uh, driven by the tech industry. Mm -hmm. The tech industry will, and I know there are some representative <laughs> of the tech industry here, and you will recognise your major discourse that is to say this is not possible, this is too many uh, that you're asking us to do, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but actually you have all the resources to do it, you have the best engineers in the world, you have all the people who can find solutions to be safer. And what I found quite funny today is that I can see when people are trying, especially when it comes to generative AI, to be in this, to, uh, be in this new market and to um, reinsure people because people are a bit scared about AI and so they will say, say, see what we can do so that AI will be safe. I'm like, oh, wow, this is wonderful. Why don't you do that on <laughs> the social media that people are using on an everyday basis? Mm -hmm. That means you have the resources to do that. So I think the regulators really need to stick to what they strongly believe a tech company should do and really stick to it because the more you listen to the tech companies, the more you think uh, they are the ones who have to implement it. And if they say it's not possible, let's try something lesser and lesser and lesser. And at the end of the day, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. Julia. Um, there definitely is a, a challenge with the fact that these harms are global and mm -hmm. a lot of the companies are global. Yeah. So as you've alluded to, um, we need to make sure that it's balanced and proportionate mm -hmm. and as far as possible that our regulation is coherent and clear um, across jurisdictions. Um, if it aids compliance, that creates better outcomes for the users and creates that safer environment. So it is a really key outcome. But we do recognise it as a challenge. Um, certainly um, at Ofcom, one of the things that we have done very recently is publish um, our consultation document for illegal harms. It includes lots of different mitigations that organisations can put in place, mm. but they don't have to. It's very much a technology neutral and it's an outcome focused approach. So if they want to take a different approach that they think is better, they're able to, but they do have to still demonstrate why that approach works, why that helps prevent the harms that um, might be otherwise happening on their platforms. So it's trying to strike that balance between 
giving organisations the space to be innovative, mm. to come up with their own mm. solutions when they know their companies best, but also supporting those organisations that might be smaller. So in the UK, um, the Online Safety Act is likely to impact over 100,000 organisations. Not all of those are going to be huge multinational yeah. companies. Yeah. So we've really tried to balance having very detailed um, mm. guidance with things that are accepted accessible and digestible and that some of those smaller companies are also able to implement so it's meeting those different challenges I think for us as regulators a big challenge is making sure we are speaking to one another it's a great opportunity to make sure we are being um, coherent we are um, supporting um, those things and I think the fact that so many of us have the same regulatory tools like mm. those risk assessments and transparency mm. notices it helps um, to share that and those are great opportunities to meet some of those challenges. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with my, my, my friends on the panel and I think um, Julia kind of beat the OECD drum a little bit for me already in relation to um, cooperation, cooperation across countries and cooperation across regulators. Perhaps so as to not labour that same point, um, a challenge also is making sure that we have good evidence for what we're doing. Um, uh, for what laws are put in place, what policies are put in place. Um, and it really is a challenge in this space. I mean, we've spoken already this morning about generative AI. I was here at this conference last year. I don't think we had any conversation about no. No. possibly AI at all. Um, or if we did, it was, it was not anywhere near the same as, as what the conversation we've had today or the conversations we've all had in the last, you know, last year or last few months. So... Um, uh, challenges is going to be keep getting evidence and, and, and getting that evidence in place so that policies are, can be fit for purpose and making policies which are based on evidence but which are also future proofed mm -hmm. um, and, and don't rely on different technologies or, or don't respond to particular technologies because as we've seen in the last 12 months um, a new technology, well, not new, but a technology um, can can go to the forefront like that and, and get everyone's attention yeah. um, with a lot of risks. And there's a risk that um, the policy response might be knee-jerked and not based on evidence. And, and, and so I think that's a really big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump on that future-proofing point and just, mm. uh, I think generally regulation mm. always lags behind technological mm. development, mm. which mm. makes it difficult. Um, the process of developing uh, legislation and getting it passed takes a long time often. Um, then there's the process of actually implementing it, getting all the um, relevant instruments and guidance set up, um, and by the time that happens, things have, have moved quite quickly in the interim. So having that sort of um, technologically neutral approach, um, mm. making sure that you're sort of continually doing that horizon scanning and, and you're prepared to deal with the next challenge as it emerges. Um, there are some really sort of forward-leaning aspects to the Online Safety Act. We were really fortunate that um, the idea of sort of you know, years ago, computer-generated imagery falling within the definitions was contemplated, both for child sexual exploitation, but once our image-based abuse laws about the non-consensual uh, distribution of intimate images came into into effect, those contemplated um, the issue of deep fakes. Yeah. Um, so we're sort of relatively well set up to deal with some of the new and emerging synthetic material, mm -hmm. even though we didn't necessarily know that synthetic material was going to be um, so indistinguishable from, from natural content. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but we can't future proof against against everything. And so mm. setting up sort of um, other approaches that can underlie the regulatory response, and we've already spoken a couple of times about safety by design, but um, that initiative for us is largely a voluntary one to try to get industry to proactively think about safety at the outset. And we, we deliver a whole range of guidance, um, which isn't meant to be sort of really specific to any particular type of platform or technology or issue, but rather to get people thinking more broadly about what might the risks be and how might they um, tailor solutions to their particular platform. Yeah. Um, so having that as the sort of foundation, which can really easily be tweaked much more so than, than a legislative response can, mm. and then layering on those other responses on top of that, which um, add sort of additional kind of regulatory um, teeth to that if, yeah. if that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can I just yeah. a small yeah. thing? Just to talk a bit for the, my friends' regulators, I think the regulators need resources. Mm. They need major resources, financial resources, human resources, brains, mm. like people who do research, who can go work for the regula regulators. I know that uh, working for tech companies is very, very attractive, and there are all these conditions that people really yeah. jump into it and say, 
I'm going to work with these big teams and have all these resources, but this is major work that is done by the regulators and they need like, people committed to do it. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. So, um, Kelly, given you're the, um, the Australian rep who've had the, the longest time to kind of have the regulation, implement the regulation, what would you say the major barriers have been? What kind of things have, have kind of got in the way and how did you, did you overcome them? What advice would you give? I think it's, it's difficult being a small country with this legislation that um, purports to sort of regulate the internet at large, yeah. um, so it's really helpful to have friends coming online, um, <laughs> to be um, working together through forums like the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, yeah. to be information sharing and, and learning from one another um, it is just incredibly huge. I think another piece has been um, the sort of information asymmetry that we've seen, and um, Julie has mentioned a couple of times, you know, transparency being a common um, element of a lot of the different regulations, so really now starting to see um, there's been a lot of voluntary transparency efforts over the years. Um, some of those have been wonderful and have brought together multi-stakeholder um, audiences to kind of really drill into what is transparency and why do we need it to hold companies accountable and, and to make change. Um, but there has, in some cases, been limited uptake of those voluntary initiatives. Yes. So now yeah. being able to back those up with um, you know, notices that are enforceable. Um, and we've exercised 13 of those notices to date um, under our regime. Really excited to see the, the reporting start under the DSA, really excited yeah. to see what's going to be coming um, out of Ofcom as well. And the more information that we can get about what's actually happening, um, the better informed the debate can be and the more we can um, really hold people accountable for, for online safety. Absolutely. I, I, might, I might just jump on yeah. that to yeah. mention that, uh, you know, back to the evidence base that we, we also, the OECD has also done some research in relation to transparency reporting, um, just to, to flow on from what Kelly said. Um, and uh, we've looked at both terrorist, violent, and extremist, terrorist and violent extremist content and the transparency reporting practices um, of, of looking at the top 50 online content sharing services um, f for, for TVEC. And we've just recently re released a report which looks at child sexual exploitation and abuse. And, and I kind of go more what, what Kelly said from our, from our research, which has looked at what has been to date um, other than the Australians Initiative and what, what has sort of just started coming under the DSA, voluntary um, practices. Um, our research has seen that um, of the 50 companies that we looked at for child sexual exploitation and abuse, only 20 of those uh, issued a transparency report, and of those 20, they all did it differently. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I think for policymakers as well, that's a big mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. um, even, even under the DSA, as I understand it, some of the reports that have recently come out um, even though the, the, the reports have to be made. Again, there's the same issues coming through with, with different metrics, um, different, different issues being, being measured. So it's still difficult um, for policymakers and researchers to really understand what's happening on each platform and to get a comparable evidence base. Um, and so that's why we've done that research and we will continue to do it. So, yeah. Julia, what about from an Ofcom perspective? I know you're at the beginning of the journey, but what's, what's next? A lot of work <laughs> is probably the short answer to that. This is where the work begins for Ofcom in many ways. We've been mm. preparing for this for a very long time and we've over 20 years of experience regulating communications with a couple of years as well in that off the video sharing platform regime. Yeah. So we've learned a lot, for example, with transparency. We published a paper last year around um, the the different things that transparency can tell you. So for example, if somebody's metric for the number of complaints goes up, does that actually mean their service got worse mm -hmm. and that there was more harm happening? Or does that mean their complaints process got better and more people understand how to use it? Mm -hmm. So there are different elements behind the transparency that I think it's great to be able to um, cooperate and learn from others um, and share our findings there. But I think for us, the big, um, what's next is bringing out um, everything to implement the Online Safety Act. So, as I said, we have our first consultation out at the minute on illegal harms. We do invite everybody to um, have a read of that and to um, respond. With a caveat, it is over a thousand pages, so maybe grab a cup of coffee. Um, but we have accessible documents as well, which are a lot shorter and summarise it, because we're really keen to hear from um, industry, from stakeholders, from international community, from affected individuals about how this actually will come out. We want this to be something that um, you know builds on the evidence base that we have, but here's as many views as possible. So by all means, please check it out, and if anyone wants to discuss it, happy to do so afterwards. 
But that is just the first phase. When that closes, we'll um, be developing it to bring out then um, that consultation um, document as the code of practice. And it has mm. things like a risk assessment guidance. It has a legal content judgment guidance to help support organisations. Then we have the second phase. That's looking at the protection of children, as I said. So we have to go through the same process of the draft consultation, getting responses, um, and then developing that. And then our third phase... And then after all of that's done, we have to regulate at that point. Um, so we have to bring out a lot of guidance to help support organisations to comply. And then we have our supervision and our enforcement where it's needed. So we've been building our teams. We're, we're ready to you know, get started and get going with doing all of that. Um, and we do look forward to um, engaging with as many people as possible. So that what next takes us into about 2025. <laughs> so that's um, what's planned. And then at some stage after that, there might be a, a short holiday for a few colleagues <laughs> um, that would be well deserved. But it's it's a continual process. Great, thank you. And what about the DSA? We're having the first results of uh, this regulation and we're quite happy to see that things are going in a good direction. Nothing is perfect, obviously, but uh, transparency is not just for transparency, but it's also to empower authorities to know better and to know how, what they can do better. Uh, as a member of parliament, I did uh, thousands of hearings uh, trying to know how moderation works, for example, for uh, uh, the big platforms, and I couldn't get any information. Now we know exactly that there are 52 people working on moderation worldwide in French for Twitter, for example. This is an information. You know that French-speaking countries are quite <laughs> numerous in yeah, the world, yeah. and there are only 52 people working on that. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a very strong action regarding the war uh, in Gaza and uh, a very, very uh, 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 fast answer from the, commission, the European Commission to ask for tech companies to tell exactly what they are doing, and answers came back in a couple of days telling how many accounts were suspended, how many content were uh, uh, deleted, how many content were labelled. Definitely, you go on uh, social media, you will see so many content that you should not see. Mm -hmm. But we are having data. We are asking also some research groups to do their own assessment. Mm -hmm. So then we can do the comparison with what the tech companies are telling. And then we can enter into an accountability uh, process. So this is going in a good direction. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Well, I've got a couple of questions left. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to you guys. So I don't know if we've got any US policy people in the audience, but I'd just like to ask each of the panelists what advice they would give to, to the US around driving forward um, online safety policy. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to volunteer going first, or I can pick I, on someone. I can <laughs> go. go on, Letitia, yeah. <laughs> Oh, the US, you have so much money, <laughs> use it, <laughs> use it. I think with the US resources and the willingness of Europe, we could just master all the digital space. So really, 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 you're so behind on that. And please, um, really use all, all, all the resources you have and just think that we're facing global harm and this is global companies. This is not US companies. This is not patriotic companies. They are defending their, and this is uh, uh, what works in all industries. They are defending their own profit. They are not defending the country. So please, please, please just uh, do not try to protect American companies as if they are protecting American citizens. This is what I would like to, to say to you. American uh, <laughs> <laughs> regulators, policymakers. Yes. Thank you. I think from our perspective, seeing systems and processes is really um, a key driver. We highly encourage the adoption of any systems and processes that really give the responsibility to a platform to take that proactive approach. It's not just reactive. They need to be proactive to prevent some of that harm taking place. Um, we would highly recommend any sort of systems and processes approach that looks at your risk assessments to proactively look at harm, that um, implements transparency to hold people to account, um, and that has that underpinning that it's not just voluntary, because when it's voluntary you will have some companies do fantastic things, they will do wonderful work, but not everybody will, and oftentimes then it's the companies that aren't doing that that are seeing the problematic content. 
um, content. So making sure that there is a floor as well as that ceiling um, yeah. to aspire to, um, to you know, to break through. So having um, that sort of approach that is rights respecting. So again, coming back to balancing the right to privacy with the right yeah. to participation, right to um, freedom of expression, and that right to be um, your full self online and be safe doing it. So a rights respecting systems and processes approach is the, the big thing that we would be recommending. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm not the best to answer this question because I'm, I'm not coming from a lawmaker's perspective, but um, certainly um, it's not a wheel that necessarily needs to be reinvented. There's, as we've heard on this panel, yeah. there's, there's other regulators, um, there's other countries that have put legislation in place. There are organisations the, like the OECD where everyone can come together, including um, US policymakers, and have these discussions and learn, learn from compatriots and discuss about what the issues are and what the problems are and the thorny things. So um, I, I guess my very short message was it's not a wheel that needs to be reinvented and, and um, I will let my, my lawmaking <laughs> colleagues um, uh, impart their wisdom as opposed to me. And I think just adding on to what, what's already been said, um, we, we have a component of our Online Safety Act which is focused on systems and processes. We also have a component which is um, acting as a safety net for individuals who are experiencing various types of harm. Mm -hmm. And we can help remediate that harm, including through content takedown. And I know that um, with the First Amendment in the US, that's probably where some of the crux of the concern is when you have conversations about um, online regulation. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back to your point about learning you know, from implementation, we. Um, We've been fortunate to benefit from really bipartisan and multipartisan support on online safety issues in Australia. Um, we do take a human rights-based approach. Every piece of legislation has to go through a human rights impact assessment. So the mm -hmm. Online Safety Act, you can find the, the impact assessment alongside it. Mm -hmm. It looks at freedom of expression, at privacy, at the right to be protected from abuse and exploitation, at children's rights. Um, and you know, coming back to that idea of transparency, it's not just company transparency, it's, it's government transparency. So we are compelled to reduce, produce an annual report every year. Yeah. There's a certain metrics that we um, have to put in there. Um, we're subject to freedom of information laws, so anybody mm -hmm. can ask for information. And then there's, you know, limited exemptions to that, but otherwise documents are generally um, released to the public. Um, and, you know, we are subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and so, you know, checks and balances can be built in and you can learn from how uh, it's been implemented in, in our country and other countries in terms of where you set that threshold so that you can um, both respect things like freedom of expression, um, but find the limitations of that around the right to be free from, from really serious forms of exploitation and abuse as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm going to pause there. Um, Andrew has a mic at the back. If you could ask questions. I'm hoping you've all got some juicy questions to ask and you could also introduce yourselves as well. Does anybody have a question? Ah, yes. Yeah, I don't mind. I can, I can speak for the last year. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Goharian. I work at Thorn. I work in research. So I was really excited to hear evidence <laughs> being um, something that was highlighted. I'd love to hear specifically from a child safety lens when it comes to online regulation. What data you think is currently lacking that is a challenge or an inhibitor to moving policy forward? I'm happy to go first. Okay, okay. thank you. If you like. So, thank you. one of the um, key things, and it, it's a great question, and if there are any researchers, we'd love to chat about how to <laughs> fill those gaps. Um, but one of the things is actually the evaluating some of the mitigations that can go into place. So for example, if you put in place a parental control, if you put in place um, a measure that prevents children from um, you know, speaking to strangers online, what is the outcome of that? What is the impact? Certainly for Ofcom, we have to be evidence-based. All of the mitigations that we suggest have to have evidence of how successful they are. And we definitely see in preparing a lot of our documents, certain areas have more evidence than others. So actually trying to make that a level playing field across any of the different things um, is really important. And trying to distinguish, although it can be very difficult, between causation and correlation 
is it because of one thing that's happening or is it um, combined with others? Is it just happening um, conveniently there? That would be one thing. And then again, with media literacy, we would see the evaluation as something we're really keen to see more research and more evaluation done on media literacy initiatives. So yeah. at Ofcom, we published an evaluation toolkit to try and help support practitioners with um, undertaking that. And it's something that then we're hoping can help the, the community with media literacy to use but we're then really keen to see the evaluation and the research done um, to evaluate those different techniques. So certainly in the UK, that's that's one area that, that we'd be keen and yeah, happy to connect after if, if that's useful. Thank you. I might add Ellie, to that yeah. as well. We um, One area that is a challenge for us and I think for, for probably everybody is um, finding out more about the lived experiences of younger children online. Yeah. Um, mm. The ethics process um, mm. that you have to go through when you yeah. speak to children and young people about sometimes very serious issues mm. um, is necessarily quite robust because yeah. you don't want to cause harm uh, in, in doing the research. Um, and we were fortunate, um, Julia mentioned our age verification roadmap, which was focused on the issue of children's access to online pornography. We managed to clear the ethics process to speak to 16 to 18 year olds about their experiences of online pornography. Mm -hmm. um, it was a challenge getting through that process. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, by the time we speak to a 16 or 18 year old, that, you know, they told us that on average their, their first encounter with that content was at age 13. So we're talking about things that happened five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, you know, being able to work hand in hand with um, really experienced child focused researchers um, and, and try to find out more about what's happening for, for younger children um, and being able to compare that as we did, as we saw this morning, with what's happening in, in parents and carers, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe when it comes to uh, European regulation, you will see that the DSA is quite poor when it comes to child's online safety. It only has an incentive to do more risk assessment because there is a real challenge today with this generation that is uh, um, uh, has a generative use of, of digital. And we often speak about online harm, but there is a question of what is online harm if there is no online suffering. There is So the problem that we have now is to define for this generation that use so much digital, what is the harm that is caused by the digital, what are the consequences that are only from the digital, and then to determine what you can do to uh, mitigate that. And that is a real, real challenge when you see how this is a full use of digital from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed. Yeah, yeah, very difficult. We just have time for, for one more question because we're the only thing that stands between you and lunch, so yeah. So I'll be quick. Uh, Itai from ActiveFence. I manage corporate development and uh, regulatory affairs. Uh, with uh, the, the question that uh, was here around US uh, regulation, do you expect uh, that what we will be seeing in the coming years, similar to what we saw with GDPR, is that the de facto regulation for U.S. companies is going to be uh, the uh, DSA and maybe the online safety bill because U.S. companies that want to have customers in those uh, domains will have to adhere to that regulation? Uh, and if so, how do you see that impacting uh, the, regu the, the regulation in states in the U.S. as well? That's a great question. <laughs> I hope not for the GDPR because I don't think it's a great regulation. Um, but I will say that we've seen, especially with generative AI, that the US is trying now to be more uh, uh, up to speed, mm -hmm. I will say. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all tech companies can say that it is more expensive for them to just um, reserve the implementation of the DSA to the European continent and to make sure that some of the provisions of the DSA do not apply to American citizens. They are losing money doing that for some of the technical features. So um, the European laws will have a good effect of contamination on American law, I believe, mm. and American practice in any way. Yeah. But there are still always this question of, in the mind, we, we talk about that, that is this First Amendment. Mm. I, I, I would like just to say that uh, the Bill of Rights in France is from 1789, and we protect freedom of speech since mm. our Bill mm. of Rights, and mm. there is no problem, there is yeah. no contradiction between safety and freedom of speech when you accept that there is no freedom to harm people. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else like Certainly that? from the, the UK, we do see that a lot of the companies that we engage with directly are global and that they do have um, 
teams that work across the globe as well as just in the UK and we know that when they're implementing some of the systems it might then be that actually some of the protections that they're putting in place are implemented globally um, and we see that actually with a lot of the regulatory alignment that we're able to support and um, some of the things that they bring in in Australia might be similar to in the UK might be similar to in Singapore that also has an online safety act so we do see that it can have an effect um, extraterritorially um, and that it can have that global impact but we also want to make sure that um, any outcome is focused on um, the, the UK citizens for, for the work that we're doing. If companies choose to improve their um, protections globally, for us that makes more citizens um, safer online, that makes more people safe online. And actually it's about learning, it's not saying that um, we implement one solution everywhere. Um, there are really great things coming out of lots of different countries and it's about um, using the best bits off those to, to create the best experience possible. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, look, I, I think I would just add that it, it, just because companies are global um, doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, requirement in one country is necessarily going to be applied in the other. Even if they do put that in place in one country, it may not happen in the other. So um, I will continue to beat my drum about uh, regulatory alignment and working together. And, and I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't think that it can be relied on or could be assumed. Um, that just because companies will be following what the regulations are under the, under the European laws, under the UK, under what's happening in Singapore, Ireland, what might happen in other countries as well with the Australian law, is that that will then be the floor or the ceiling in, mm -hmm. in the US or other countries without that regulation. So, um, uh, so I, 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 I just I will beat my uh, regulatory cooperation and, and harmonisation drum again. So. Mm. And on that same point again, I think observing how um, the legislation is implemented in other countries and the success stories that they have might be a, a form of inspiration here as well where they choose not to sort of um, take on those protections in all jurisdictions. So one thing that we were quite inspired to see when we were doing our age verification roadmap work was um, around Ofcom and, and OnlyFans being based in the UK. And Ofcom has quite, um, you know, good protections in place from the creator side in terms of age assurance and identity verification to try to prevent the issue of child sexual exploitation on its platform. However, in terms of fans coming onto the site and um, accessing some of the content, they didn't, at, at the start, have very robust age assurance protections at the outset. So the people encountering that content might have been quite young. Um, and then through some of the regulatory interventions that we saw out of the UK, they actually applied much more stringent um, protections on, on the fan side. They, they didn't, as far as I know, choose to implement that worldwide, but now mm. Australia mm. is quite clearly looking at that as an example and, and sort of looking at, right, how can we make sure that those same protections are afforded um, to, to our citizens. So I think at, at, you know, as we see the flow on effects, if they aren't necessarily flowing onto other parts of the world, perhaps that can be a, a form of inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, can I just very briefly add to yeah. that that I think this is so important because if we don't Otherwise, there's, there's, we're going to end up with a situation where we will have unequal protection for yeah. children yeah. Um, absolutely. Ac across different countries as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We continue to bang the drum. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, please join me in giving our panellists a round of applause. <laughs> so much and um, lunch is served in the main area through there and all of our guests are around all day if you want to try and catch people. Thank you.